And it looks like we're getting there, folks. Okay, one minute past the hour. Let me start my introduction and move into introducing our fantastic speakers today. This particular webinar today is a webinar about the launch or about the report that we have just launched on climate aligned bonds. This has been a regular tracking report for the Club of Bonds Initiative. It looks at bonds issued by companies where the proceeds can clearly be identified as going towards a climate related investment. But in these cases, the issuers haven't labeled, maybe not even appreciate that their bonds are climate related. I'll let Amanda Giorgio, senior analyst at Climate Bonds Initiative, talk about the report in a couple of minutes. But first, Yolanda Chung from DBS, who has kindly brought DBS in as a supporter of this project. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing and your interest in this area, Yolanda, just to get us going. Thank you, Sean. Well, we feel very privileged at DBS uh, headquarters in Singapore to be able to sponsor and contribute to this piece of very important research. One great relevance for Asia. Uh, we see that a considerable number of the climate aligned issuers reside in this part of the world. We do believe that sustainable finance is going to become mainstream finance. And what we mean by that is, it's not just about integrating environmental social governance considerations into our banking products, products and services. We actually think that either companies that we bank or FIs that we bank, they have been able to identify a credible pipeline of green social sustainability projects and assets. Or if you don't, there is always room for improvement and we can structure something along the lines of sustainability link instruments. So I think climate aligned label um, is one way of making sustainable finance mainstream. For issuers who are currently identified as climate aligned to move into a label bond, don't look at it as just a relabeling exercise. I think it is actually a way for issuers to think long and hard to fine tune their strategy, to communicate their strategy and their long term vision to investors, use the uh, migration from climate alignment to being a labeled bond as coming with greater scrutiny to beef up your disclosure because that's what investors want to know. Um, nowadays, investors are very educated and very savvy about bond that is labeled, unlabeled, climate aligned, sustainability linked. But what they all want is transparency. There is nothing that you can pull wool over their eyes and say, I, I've got this label or I've not got this labeled. Actually, it works in both ways. You can have a label, investors may not agree, you may not have a label and investors actually like you. So I think um, this piece of research is a very important contribution to that dialogue. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you so much. Yolanda is Head of Sustainable Sustainability at Institutional Banking Group. Um, my apologies for my accent. Yesterday, someone said I said banking, not banking. Uh, I'm working on that at DBS Bank. Uh, we have with us today, apart from Mandel comments in a minute, um, Niraj Seth, Head of Asian Credit at BlackRock. We have uh, Letitia Hamon, who's Head of the Sustainable Finance, at uh, Head of Sustainable Finance at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange and the Luxembourg Green Exchange. We have Aurelia Geber from the senior, as a Senior Finding Officer at Eurofema. And we have Clifford Lee, who's Managing Director and Global Head Fixed Income Treasury Markets at DBS Bank. Uh, Aurelia, it may well be Jeber, not Geber. I'm afraid, uh, my apologies for that. Um, you have to correct me. Uh, I'm Sean Kidney. I'm the CEO of the Client Bonds Initiative. You know the background. We have an extraordinary challenge by 2030 to get emissions down globally, 55%. We have the major economies of the world now committing to aggressive 2030 targets. Uh, we need to drive this particular change and we need to uncover those people who are doing good work, which is what we're doing. And as Yolanda says, we need to look at how we bring that market, those issuers into the, into the light, into the spotlight as part of all of this. 
Um, that's the background. Uh, we have only a short time to act, but we are succeeding. We want to say that in the thematic markets, we're getting close to $2 trillion outstanding of green and sustainable bonds, the variety of the markets. We will see roughly half a trillion issued just this year in the green space. This is US dollars, half a trillion dollars. Uh, and that's a rapid growth. It's still small compared to where we need. Uh, and that's a rapid growth. It's still small compared to where we need to be. Global bond markets are above $100 trillion outstanding. And we really need to see about 4 to $5 trillion of capital flowing, including bonds, each year in the right direction to have success. We've got a long way to go before we get that. But nevertheless, things are changing. Uh, I'm going to ask Amanda Giorgio, show us what's in this report and we will get a sense of the opportunity. Thanks, Sean, and good morning or good afternoon, indeed, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today presenting the results of the, of the Climate Align research, which has been a year in the making. Um, so you can you probably see that um, it's quite time intensive. But before I do that, of course, I want to thank our fellow panelists today. Thanks for joining our session. Um, and of course, our sponsor, DBS Bank as well. I would also like to thank the wider um, CBI team, the markets team, uh, which has worked uh, on the report and uh, whose contributions have been very valuable. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to take you through the key highlights from our research. Um, and of course, feel free to ask questions or to drop in, in the Q&A um, section at the bottom. So let's start with um, what is this report about? I mean, it was already introduced uh, quick, uh, shortly by Yolanda and Sean, but indeed this report looks at unlabeled climate aligned bonds. These bonds finance climate aligned activities, but are not explicitly labeled by the issuer. This is in contrast with the green bond uh, or thematic bond market, where the issuer explicitly puts a label on their bonds. Examples or the most prominent ones would be green, social or sustainability bonds. For the purpose of this report, um, we uh, define climate aligned activities uh, within our climate aligned activities tables, which you can find in our report. Let's talk about why we do this. Uh, why is this important? Well, we want to shed light on capital flows financing green or climate aligned activities. And why do we want to do that? Because we want to explore or find and discover opportunities for uh, financing green assets which extend beyond the labeled bond market. This is also particularly of interest to dedicated investors who might be interested in financing uh, green or climate aligned um, assets and activities. Finally, this uh, research uh, has a value because it provides an opportunity to scale up the labeled bond market in that some of the climate aligned bonds discovered might as well be eligible to be issued under the green label. How do we, how do we find these bonds if they're unlabeled. Well, let me take you through our methodology. Our methodology is mainly based on two uh, particular processes. The first one is the issuer screening, and the second is the identification of climate aligned bonds. So, as I said, we this methodology is based on the on the issuer screening. So we look at a pool of eligible climate aligned issuers. And we try to identify the percentage of the revenues which are linked to climate aligned activities. Once we do that, we diversify the type of issuers that we find into broad categories. We have fully aligned issuers which derive at least 95% of revenues from climate aligned activities. And we have strongly aligned issuers which derive at least 75% of the revenues from climate aligned activities. Any issuer which derives less than 75% of the revenues from such activities is excluded from the purpose of this research. 
The issue screening is indeed the most time intensive part of the research. To give you an idea, we looked at uh, over 2000 companies, including financial arms and subsidiaries, and we ended up including only 420 issuers, which are climate aligned. So the second phase of our research uh, is to identify the, their bond, the bonds issued by our pool of climate aligned issuers. So for fully aligned issuers, we take the entire debt and we consider it climate aligned. For strongly aligned issuers, we use a different approach. So we actually apply a pro rata alignment uh, to their debt outstanding. This means that, for instance, if a company is 80% aligned, then only 80% will be considered climate aligned. The combination of uh, the climate aligned debt from strongly aligned and fully aligned issuers constitutes the unlabeled climate aligned universe. Also um, worth noting that for, for our research, we only use publicly available information. In particular, we base ourselves on any reports, sustainability reports or websites on occasion. Also, um, the, the data presented today is as of Q3 2020, starting from January 1st, 2005, which is the, uh, the year which corresponds to the Kyoto Protocol ratification. Now let's jump into some actual results and highlights. Well, the key figure is that we actually find 913 billions USD of outstanding climate aligned bonds, as well as over a trillion of climate aligned bond issued. This is quite remarkable in the sense that the, if we want to compare it with the labeled bond universe, we actually discover uh, 1.7 trillion of uh, thematic bonds issued. So this corresponds to almost 50% of the labeled bond universe. In terms of uh, climate aligned issuers, we discovered 420 issuers, of which three quarters are uh, fully aligned and approximately a quarter is strongly aligned. Because our research is global, we um, found such issuers domiciled across 45 countries. Let's look at uh, regional issuance. So as you can see from the chart on my right hand side, Asia Pacific leads issuance and uh, that's followed by Europe and North America. Interestingly, 74% um, of the debt from Asia Pacific is actually attributed to China, which corresponds to 36% of the climate aligned debt globally, which is indeed quite remarkable. France and the United States are then the other two top countries for climate aligned issuance. If we look at climate themes, so climate themes are the or correspond to the business where our climate aligned issuers operate. As you can see, over 50% of the debt outstanding is actually attributed to transport companies, which dominate the climate aligned universe followed by energy, water, and ICT. Waste in buildings and land use account for a minor share. Interestingly, if we actually look at the regional spread of climate themes, we can see that Asia Pacific is quite well dominated by transport as well as Europe. However, approximately 90% of the debt coming from transport comes from railway companies, which have also historically dominated our research. So these are the, the key highlights of our findings. And um, I'd like to touch on a few challenges that we encountered in light of the fact that we always try to improve our methodology and our research going forward. So the main issue or challenge that we encounter is that data is quite difficult to find. As I said at the beginning, we base our analysis on revenues. So we're trying to see the percentage of revenues from a company which are green. However, such disclosure is not standardized across companies, in particular within uh, annual reports. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, it becomes quite problematic to try to determine the revenues coming from green activities from business which are highly diversified, as well as it's quite difficult to evaluate the green credential 
of some activities. This is in contrast with the labor and bond market where transparency is, is well more established than this is uh, for any reports. Of course, because there are guidelines and uh, which are set in the green bond principles. So one way of overcoming some of these shortcomings would potentially be for issuers, climate aligned issuers to issue under the green label. As this was um, mentioned even in the introduction of this session, the label is well more scrutinized and investors have more assurance in what they're putting their money in. Good news is that 40% of the climate aligned bonds will mature, which we discovered in our search, will mature by 2024, which um, opens up considerable opportunities uh, to scale up the green bond market, but also for issuers to label their debt. However, we also uh, envisage that a more standardized disclosure and a common language to define green assets will also highly uh, enhance the transparency of climate aligned issuers. In this respect, we see Europe leading with uh, the EU taxonomy regulations already uh, providing some um, solutions to the, let's say, shortcomings that we, can, that we have discovered during our research. In particular, this is addressed within the EU Taxonomy uh, Delegated Act, which sets clear uh, definitions for what constitutes green and climate line activities, as well as the sustainability reporting disclosure, in particular with examples from the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, which sets a clear definitions of uh, what should be disclosed at a company level. Thank you for listening. Um, I, we welcome your feedback. So if you'd like to send us an email at markets uh, at carbons.net, it would be much appreciated. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, the report is in the note in the chat. Sorry, the link to the report is in the chat if you want to download it quickly. Uh, Amanda, we've had a first question from you just around transport. Let me just throw that in. Uh, do we have a breakdown of types of transport, land, air, sea, public transport, private transport? in the report? Is there detail for people? And where is the largest slice? No, we don't in the report, at least. Um, so the largest, the largest is definitely um, associated with railway companies. It accounts for 90% of the entire debt from transport. Um, everything else is very minor, unfortunately. We have some EVs, companies, uh, hydrogen, public transportation uh, in particular would be the main ones that we, that we find. But again, if I may just link back to the problem of actually finding the data, many auto companies wouldn't necessarily share their revenues, which comes from specific EV vehicles, for instance, because the, the revenue breakdown will be disclosed at a much higher level. So this is what I mean, for examples of uh, difficulties in finding the data. If there would be better disclosure, perhaps we would have found more companies operating also in EV or, or hydrogen, for instance. And in those two key areas of shipping and, and aviation, we don't really see pure play companies much around the world. There are a couple of companies with uh, ferries that are moving towards batteries. You know, the New Zealand Straits ferry is looking at a battery-based solution. So that looks interesting going forward. And certainly the and Norway to Oslo ferry from Helsingborg has shifted towards batteries, but the companies behind them are mixed companies and they've got other assets as well. So they don't fit easily into this. In the aviation area, the truth is there is very little currently in the aviation sector which would meet Paris Agreement kind of materiality because of the emissions involved in it. There are some interesting developments about battery-related aviation or hydrogen fuel planes, but they seem to be one, two to 15 years off at this stage. So we're not seeing those show up. Uh, I say that because someone was asking me after, yesterday about this question. So it's rail. Yeah, it's rail for uh, shipping. We actually have a few examples, um, but they're not necessarily running on batteries, but um, because it's public transport, we assume this is climate aligned, but however, we would like to see these companies uh, transitioning into more sustainable or green technologies. Uh, so, so it's a discovery process. Niraj, I'm wondering if I can ask you to kick us off today in this roundtable. Niraj, who's a 
uh, represents BlackRock in in um, in Asia. Uh, BlackRock is, as people may not know, the world's largest investor by assets under management at this stage, and of course has been one of the drivers of the green bonds and the thematic bond market. What's your take on all of this from BlackRock's perspective, and and of course, what are you looking for? Sure. So, I think Sean the topic of green bonds and the climate bonds and in fact the broader ESG when you think about it i think this is one of the biggest shifts we are seeing in a long time in the financial markets and in the world in terms of where we are trying to go and this is critical this is critical at all possible levels that one can imagine for the future of the world and how we live so i think this is certainly something which is going to take a main stage and it's going to go from something what we have seen in the last few years as a niche focus to something mainstream and some you touched on this if you look at the extent of green bonds touching touching 2 trillion the number sounds big but in context of the rest of the broader financial markets it still has a long way to go and that's i think the direction of travel now in terms of how we think about that travel and the specific areas we are focused on and how we look at that just briefly touching on that. Uh, in terms of obviously within Asia, uh, how we're looking at it in that direction of travel, it starts with obviously the data quality and data analytics, the ability to actually understand what it is. The second is the standardization and then the ability to actually uh, measure a number of these uh, climate aligned and more specifically the green label products. And third is to be able to analyze and have more transparency around it, which is what our clients are looking at us to do. And we look at it and have a lot of details in that direction of travel, not just obviously measuring what exists, but also working with a number of companies along with our partners like Cliff and everybody else to make sure that we are helping the system to move in that direction in terms of improvement of data availability, uh, build proprietary data analytics aspect and work with obviously the large organizations on the standardization and measurement. So we look at a lot of those details, but the key all comes down to building the transparency and the trust with the investors who are asking for it. And I think that will be a critical focus, as I can imagine, looking forward, what's going to drive bringing the green bonds and the, the whole framework into the mainstream from where we are today. So I think having that transparency and trust is uh, what we are trying to build. So that's interesting, Raj. So you're saying that there's actually a lot of appetite for transparency and uh, around these and for investments that transparency will uncover. That's, this, is, this, is a, this is a myth of, in Asia as well as the US as well as Europe. That is true. Now, obviously, you have to think of it in two different dimensions. From the flow of capital, it's global. So the capital obviously is fairly intermingled in terms of the global markets. And you see that flow of capital from different parts of the world to Asia and from Asia to rest of the world. So I think that's fairly straightforward that you do see that capital flowing, which is looking for actually a combination of finding returns and then creating an impact. On the borrower side, we're looking, at least my role is more specific to Asia, so I'm much closer to that. So we're looking at much more from an Asia lens and trying to obviously work with a number of companies in the region and the partners, as I said, to make sure that we are making a difference in terms of creating awareness with regards to the value of moving towards the climate bonds moving towards more sustainable bonds moving towards a much more of a responsible investment framework and i think that's still a journey where we are in the early stages in asia the data quality obviously is something still needs a lot more work from here but clearly the direction of travel is there and i would say it's actually un very encouraging to see and you have covered this to some extent in the report when you look at the issuance what part of the issuance is asia pacific which looks obviously quite uh, promising that the borrowers, the companies have started to understand the importance. I think if you had asked me two or three years back, the answer would have been different, that it's still very niche. I think we've started to see that shift towards the mainstream and the borrowers understanding the importance of obviously creating the transparency, having more of a proper green labeled bond issuance, which we have seen a meaningful increase over the course of last 12 months. Fantastic. Let me cut to Clifford at that particular point, because you've you've essentially given us a, 
a strong picture of the nature of the interest, nature of demand. Clifford, tell us about the opportunity here. I mean, to bring people into the thematic market in particular, Yolanda was talking about that at the beginning. What do you see on the ground with your, the issuers and the, uh, you're working with the companies you're working with? Is there interest? Is there movement? Can we do something exciting? Sure, Sean. I mean, uh, just uh, taking, uh, taking on the point that uh, Niraj has mentioned, uh, the awareness at this juncture has grown substantially than just uh, 12, 24 months ago. At this, uh, and, and part of it, I'd argue, in Asia is really brought upon by the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, the social uh, stress and, and uh, the, uh, the loss of jobs, potential more loss of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. All this is coming in and the concert, the, the the uh, concepts of uh, climate accountability, societal accountability, all this is now up front and center. It is no longer just sort of a, a reporting requirement, if you may. And, and to borrow a uh, Nirash term, the shift, the shift of mindset, the shift of uh, uh, perception is, is, is irreversible at this juncture. So now for um, uh, in, in our engagement of issuers across Asia, the, the question now is not, if they should be concerned about this, but how they can how they can participate in in this movement and and how much more can they communicate and understand uh, the stakes. Um, the report is extremely uh, encouraging and interesting to to on on our side in terms of en engaging issuers and investors alike because um, it shows that for the unlabeled. Uh, bond uh, climate line bond issuers and companies you see a big chunk of it actually coming out from the asia pacific region and in actual issuance um, you see it uh, already building up across asia pacific because uh, the whole of last year we have like uh, 78 billion of, of uh, themed labeled bond issue uh, out of apac last year and this year year to date itself is already exceeded that number across 100 billion so yeah, you see the pace that. growing yeah and yep. you see the pace growing but the report shows the even bigger uh, potential that, that, that uh, lies in the near future, to Amanda's point, right? A large bulk of those unlabeled uh, climate-aligned bonds will be maturing soon. And, and it, it allows us to communicate this to the Asian region, the Asian uh, uh, Asia-Pacific issuers, to say that actually a lot, a big part of their business activities, revenue streams and assets are already climate-aligned. And the, the next step of making formalizing their their practices and their commitments to, to make sure that uh, it remains uh, uh, climate aligned, that they have uh, parameters that they are happy to be held accountable to. That step is really closer and easier than had previously been envisaged. So we're very excited to be able to share that into the market because uh, and, and it's not just uh, climate aligned bonds out of Asia. Bonds out of Asia is already uh, uh, lacking the supplies needed for, for global participation. That's why a bulk of it, 80, 90% of the bond issues out of Asia is still, is still taken up by Asian investors. It's not because uh, there's lack of uh, interest from the rest of the world, but there's just not enough supply, right? Vis-a-vis -vis the, the uh, uh, liquidity that, 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 is, uh, that exists to uh, chase after these bonds. So same thing, the, the, or the problem is even more chronic for label, uh, uh, green bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds. There's uh, uh, a lot of interest, as you heard from Niraj of representing BlackRock, in terms of uh, wanting more supply, understanding uh, uh, and having a common de uh, definition of, of, of such bonds to be able to be more active from the investment front. So with this report, we're hoping to engage more issuers to be able to bring properly structured, labeled, uh, green social sustainable bonds into the market so that this can grow, investor base across the world can grow, and this whole uh, initiative can really be turbocharged more than ever. Yeah, I mean, a sense the report says not only there are 900 plus billion dollars of bonds which are climate aligned, but actually there's 900 plus, plus billion dollars of bonds which could easily be bought into the thematic market. That's right. That's or, or, right. Aurelia, at Eurofema, you're the archetypal climate-aligned issuer. You have been, uh, you're the U Europe's agency for funding rail investments. And um, for those questions, uh, people ask you why rail? Low carbon transport folks. We need to get people out of cars and out of trucks with fossil fuels and resource inefficiency into mass transit and so on. 
Of course, this is a bit of a uh, post-pandemic issue. During the pandemic, we've seen public transport go down, but that's but still freight rail has been extraordinary. Or Eurofema has been financing this for a long time, has appeared in our climate reliant reports a long time. But at Eurofema, you've also made a decision to pursue the thematic market. So you're the classic example of a company who uh, can be considered to be climate aligned, but has found benefits with the extra transparency and the protocols, as Niraj was saying earlier. Can you tell us a bit about that journey, Aurelia, and how that happened and, and um, why you, Eurofema has chosen this pathway? Sure, Sean. <clears throat> But first of all, let me thank you, uh, Amanda, also for the report, which is very informative and uh, it helps uh, understand the, uh, the milestones of sustainable finance. And I was actually very proud to discover that uh, we are first climate uh, aligned SSA uh, issuer. So as you uh, described, yeah, we operate the transport sector and in particular railway transportation is key to decarbonization and zero net zero. Our business model, as you said, we finance solely passenger transportation, rolling stock. So we are a pure play, what you would say. And, um, but we also decided to offer green label bonds and theme bonds. I must say at the time uh, of the launch of the framework in 2017, when I also started, myself, I had moments of doubts because I thought this is a company I'm joining. They only do sustainable mobility, why is it that now we launch a, a framework, a, a label bond? Why should we do that? Um, and uh, actually we felt pressure from the markets being the banks and the investor. And this really led us to now uh, decide that we want to target a label bonds if you want more than 80%. And I think the main difference between now uh, a climate aligned, if you want, uh, issuer uh, and, and the label bonds is the fact that in the framework, you have stricter rules. You really, as you say, you standardize, you need to ring fence, you have use of proceeds versus an entire business, business model. And in our, in our example, we decided to really only strictly include electric uh, rolling stock, and we left out the diesel. Diesel is nevertheless also sustainable because you reach out sometimes in regions where there is no other way of transportation. The lines are not electrified yet, and it's still better than driving a thousand cars if you can bring all people on, on one mm. train, even if it's diesel. So we still think it's sustainable, but we strictly wanted to take it out of the framework. And this year also, uh, we moved very quickly to be EU taxonomy, uh, to get to reach for the EU taxonomy alignment. For us, it was important because we could feel from the market, there is a need for, again, what Mirage said and what Clifford said, standardization. And so I think we have to recognize there are different types of investors. They are the ones who really focus on, on the label, the, the use of proceeds, the impact data. They really need to, uh, to report on this. It's, it's very important for them and for their end investors as well. And the ones who are still a bit more um, sustainable focus overall, looking at ESG rating, uh, balance sheet focus of the business or doing their own sustainability analysis. Um, but I think even this group is going to move forward into more having impacts, having to report on impact. So even the second group, I think, needs to be more uh, precise in the way they, they analyze the companies and, and that's what they want. And what I want to share with you also is uh, once we made this uh, happening uh, with the framework in Eurofema, the label, it really forced us um, to transform from within, which is important. We started to be capital markets department doing this framework, but then with the impact reporting, we, uh, we were also working with the middle office uh, and now integrating the risk management, if you want. Uh, and uh, so it really helped structure the organization 
a, a step further into this, if you want, sustainable uh, focus. And, uh, and management is fully, fully also behind that. So in a nutshell, we are, as, uh, as, as, um, as Eurofima, we invest in sustainable mobility. That is really our strategy. That's how we want to, to operate. And the future, what we see is uh, what is going to be important is the, uh, the, the, the relevant data that, that we bring, that we standardize, that we are transparent. We, we, we need to be to go a step further still uh, and, uh, and increase the, um, the standards. So we, as an organization now, we work on the GRI, for example. In the US, I know uh, they have the, 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 the task force as well. And uh, we also work very closely with the rating agencies to communicate, to really be transparent as much as, as possible. So that's uh, a bit in a nutshell what I wanted to, to share with you about our journey, Sean. And has the, the response from your investor base been as you expected through this process in terms of shifting the thematic bonds, increased engagement and so on that other, other issuers report? Um, yes. Um, we, we, it's difficult for us to measure um, the reaction of the investors because what we have done, we have really fully shifted from um, a more shifted because now we issue 80% of our issues, they are, they are green. And so if we wanted to, to make a comparison between uh, conventional bond and, no, and, and, and green bonds, it, it would be uh, difficult because we don't have that enough supply to like for like make comparison. And there are also other factors like the currency and, and the tenor that makes it difficult to know if now has the investor really shifted and moved from one to the other. But what we um, surely can say is that um, investor, we have a much better engagement when we have uh, talks with them. Uh, we don't, only talk about credit risk, like in the past, you know, it's more about really now uh, sustainability, climate change, and, and what we do, and, and our um, additionality uh, or impacts. We have different themes and subjects uh, that, that we, are we have now than previously, so it makes it very interesting. Our investor base, I can say also, uh, has diversified. We reach out now to more Nordics, Germany, France, and then that's for geography, uh, but then for types of investor, we have many more different types of asset management funds that we did not have in the books before. And, uh, okay. and most, mostly also we increase reputation, which reputation and our visibility uh, in the market, uh, which is really a win-win situation, I think, for, for both the investor then and, and for, the, for the issuer. It'll be interesting to see with your underlying asset base, the shift um, from diesel to hydrogen. I mean, we certainly have Italian railways and German railways trialing hydrogen replacing diesel at the moment. So uh, it might lead to some changes going forward. But one of the most interesting things you say is about transparency and visibility. Letitia, you, at the exchange, of course, you've made a you've been a champion of this particular issue. Is this a common story that the transparency and visibility issues are, or demand, if you like, are driving the market going forward? And and what have you been doing at the at the exchange to support this kind of thing? Well, thank you, thank you very much, Shannon. Congratulations uh, also on the reports. It's true that I heard many of those panelists uh, this morning, actually, I think all of them mentioning transparency and trust. And this is exactly the role of a stock exchange as a market operator, as a, as a neutral market operator. This is our main objective is to bring transparency and trust and explain to both investors and issuers the type of investment opportunities that are out there. And it's, uh, obviously, notably to answer the climate uh, goals. So what we've decided to do at the stock exchange is to, um, you know, we have a green exchange first, we have the Luxembourg green exchange, and we have uh, different windows, uh, green social sustainability SLBs. 
But earlier this year, we also created a section that is a climate aligned issuers section. And we did that actually together with CBI. And the creation of that section came from an observation and exactly the same thing as Aurelia explained that investors are calling for more supply of products and more diversity of products because they need to um, meet their climate objectives. Um, I was looking yesterday actually at the Climate Action 100 Plus uh, initiative of investors and they are around 550 investors uh, amounting to trillions of dollars that want to invest in climate finance. So I'm not surprised when Aurelia said that the conversation shifts toward um, climate discussions. And so when we observed that, uh, we thought it was a good idea also to shed the light of inv on investment opportunities that were a little bit under the radar. And those are the unlabeled bonds that are issued by climate aligned issuers. And that's really what we are trying to do here uh, with that section. First, explain to investors that they are investment opportunities from those climate aligned issuers. Explain to issuers that they are one step from turning their bonds to labeled bonds if they add more disclosures and more transparency. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do. Looking at what we have on the section uh, more specifically, um, we have 176 bonds on the section. It, I, I can find some, some similarities with the report where transport is the major um, sector in there. We've got Eurofima actually as a climate aligned issuer, uh, but also with 20 green bonds on the Luxembourg Green Exchange. So you see the barrier between um, being a climate aligned issuer and having labeled fund is not that strict. We've got, we, we see a number of issuers that also have labeled bonds. Um, and we see also um, different other sectors like uh, renewable energy, uh, ICT, water management, and, uh, and waste management uh, on that section. So really the objective here is also because we are an international um, stock exchange and Niraj mentioned that uh, it is important as well. And because the study also uh, highlights that Asia is one of the region where there are most climate aligned issuers. We are an international exchange. There is no local market in Luxembourg. Uh, you may know that. Uh, and so we can also, <laughs> or it's very small. Uh, so we can also raise visibility from those international in issuers in Asia and other regions of, of the world and explain that to investors. So that's really what we're trying to do um, here at the stock exchange. Uh, it, it's fantastic. And of course, you've got listings around the world. But uh, I, I want to just stress for our listeners that um, Luxembourg has taken a leadership position on this issue. There have been copycats. I'm not really saying copycats. <laughs> I mean, there are other people who are also trying to grow this market. Um, it would, and it's really important to note that the work of, of the Singapore Stock Exchange, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, the Shanghai Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, and of course, it goes on, Frankfurt, NASDAQ, NYSE, SIX, and many exchanges, Johannesburg Stock Exchange around the world, they've all got green listings now. In fact, many of them working together. Luxembourg Stock Exchange is a member of the Financial Centers for All, which is an association of cities working on green finance where stock exchanges taking a leadership role in them. So there's a kind of, you said, there's kind of global wave, a global movement around this now, isn't there, that you've been part of trying to engender, I think. Is that, have I got that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, when we when we created the stock ex the Luxembourg Green Exchange back in 2016, it was we were we were the first ones or one of the first. But it's true that now everybody is is working on that, and that's really good. That's that's a very good signal that the other stock exchanges are also trying to have their green segments and shed visibility on the more local markets. Uh, there is an, there is um, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Stock Exchange is also that is very active on that. So we are working all together also to bring that market forward. So and and that's what I like actually by working in that sustainable finance area is that of course we are competitors, but also we work together with the same objective. So we also collaborate. We also share initiatives. Um, and that's really what the market need, I believe. Huh? And that's the same thing for the regions when you observe different taxonomies here and there, different standards. It's good. It's good that there are different initiatives, but then everybody needs to work together and align 
at least explain and, and map the differences and the similarities between all of these initiatives. And so investors are not lost. We don't want uh, market fragmentation, that's important to say. So investors shouldn't be lost. They should understand even if there are differences here and there. Uh, but that's important that we all work together. Niraj, one of the features of this report is that 90% of the bonds are investment grade. Um, I'm interested, what do you see in terms of the appetite, especially on the thematic side? I mean, is it an investment grade appetite? Do people just basically want AAA like Eurofema is? Uh, or is the de demand spread across the credit ratings? What are, your see what are you seeing? What's BlackRock's view? And of course, what are your clients looking for in this area? I think in the longer term, this should go across the credit spectrum. I see absolutely no reason that this shouldn't be mainstream. And if we go, if we do believe in the point where Sean, you started that this is going to go mainstream and green is the destination, that is not something that should have obviously be linked to just the rating system or a certain level size or quality of issuer. But what does happen is when you think about some of these big shifts that we are living through right now, the larger issuers, obviously, where you have a higher credit rating, have more awareness, have more talent, more of the focus, and are probably first to move towards this shift and get to that destination. But I do think this is going to go broad based. And if I think in a very simple terms and saying green is the destination, I would split the broader group of the borrower or the companies in three parts. The one is the ones who have started the journey. So they are climate aligned, they are already on that journey. Second is people who are at the destination who already have a green label in terms of issuance. And you see maybe right now more investment grade, but I do expect that to broaden. And then you ha will have the veterans who continue to in fact renew their license in that destination by better monitoring, tracking, implementation and creating the transparency and trust required that the investors are looking for. And that's how the investor preference also will actually tilt or pivot towards those issuers. But in a longer horizon, this is not going to be restricted by credit rating in my view. That, that's cheery. So really anyone in the space, whatever their current credit rating can play. I guess actually one good example is that even a, a company in India, which has some controversies in some markets, Adani has had a very successful green bond program. And I think they're sitting around double B or thereabouts at the moment. Um, so there's a scale in there. But Clifford, you're the one who's actually having to put the case to people that there is um, uh, an opportunity here. First, what's your reaction to that, um, that uh, rating issue in terms of what you're actually seeing on the ground and people and the nature of interest? And how do you, what are you seeing as the key drivers, the key arguments for issuers to come for, across from the climate line space into the thematic space? Well, um, first off, I'll say that uh, a, a good chunk of the, the uh, climate aligned bonds are in the investment grade space, mainly because there are more investment grade bonds out there. I'll say yep. that, right? And That's I always tell point. issuers that if, if your, your credit or your pricing expectations just doesn't meet the market's uh, needs or demands, making it green and making it social doesn't change it, you know? So... This, this has two, two things I guess we need to put out there in the first place, but like, uh, like what Niraj says, there's no reason why the green label or the uh, green label bonds, the social bonds should be limited to the investment grade space. We did a, we did a, uh, a double V issuance for Jaffa Kong feed, uh, sustainability linked bond out of Indonesia, and that was well received globally. So there's no reason for it to be limited uh, to the investment grade uh, area. It just so happens that there, there are more investment grade bonds out there. And you know uh, the 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 label uh, uh, ESG theme bonds would therefore uh, have a larger showing in, in that regard. And um, I think going forward, uh, as the market matures and stabilizes, you would see uh, green bonds, social bonds in the double B space, in the triple B space. And that the the rating is a matter of credit; it's not a matter of uh, ESG best practices. So I I think the two would be different. And, and the, the same focus would be seen for investment grade issuers as well as non-investment grade issuers across the region. Uh, 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 so, okay, fair enough. So can I just take you back then to the issue of opportunity? You know, what, what, um, 
get listeners to, to understand is how many people are knocking on your door now or how much are you having to go out and knock on the doors of other people in this transition? You know, we, we've, we've heard about investor demand. I think the implication is this is a supply challenge. I'm just curious to know how strong the supply issue is and, of course, how likely we are to see a rapid change in, the, in, in supply. In terms of um, ESG conversations, ESG focus in term, for, for the issuers, I'll say that, like was mentioned before, the, uh, that conversation has really come up uh, uh, to, to the top of priority. We have some discussions with the CFOs, with the CEOs. Many times when we talk about the sustainable bond market um, and, and there's a dial, and you see the CEOs of the respective issuers getting personally involved. So this is an important uh, topic, not just for, you know, uh, it's not just a funding function, if you may. It's something that the companies uh, as a whole is trying to figure out uh, how best they can proceed in this, in this uh, step of making sure that their, their businesses, their, their, uh, their um, parameters are uh, of best market standards because they increasingly so they'll be held accountable to it, whether it's from uh, investors or regulators and the like, or you know, uh, from their competitors. All this uh, is really becoming such an important topic that um, we are we are seeing it being talked about more and more and more. Whether we're speaking to corporates or even sovereign issuers, it's all the same. So the the real thing is for them to understand and be aware of. Uh, the, what is the market standard, the minimum market standard at least, for them to be able to uh, cross the hurdle and then to take definitive steps to do more. So we're at the point where issuers and uh, across uh, the region, they're thinking of how they can execute, not whether they should be involved or whether they should, they should be concerned. So now it's really with regards to understanding it and trying to, to implement it. So that's why I said that the, this uh, study, this paper from uh, CBI is really timely because we can then further the conversation and get people to understand the, what's really needed for, for them to get that step further to formalize a practice, a commitment of a client, uh, a climate accountability. Fantastic. Aurelia, this market was driven by investors like BlackRock and so on in the world before. And, uh, and of course, we've had different alliances. As my friend uh, Chung Hachara has been saying in the chat boxes, the Net Zero Owners Alliance, the Climate Action 100 Plus Alliance, there's a lot of investor alliances now, um, which are promoting these kinds of things. But of course, you said something very interesting. You mentioned that you're looking to align the Eurofema uh, green issuance against the EU taxonomy. And a big change that we've seen happening in the past couple of years has been the engagement of regulators in driving this market. In China, for our listeners, the uh, People's Bank of China designated a green projects catalogue at the beginning of 2015 that has underpinned the growth of the Chinese market. In other words, in China, it's not about making a case to investors. It's about meeting the formal regulation that the People's Bank of China has issued in terms of what's a, what you can call green in China. I, Europe is shifting this direction with the European taxonomy, which hasn't come into force yet, but is um, before the parliament at this stage. Uh, has that guidance made life easier or harder for you? Uh, or how important do you see that going forward? The, the regulatory guidance that's come through is this is part of the taxonomy, and which is, by the way, on the agenda in other markets where ASEAN Central Bank has set up a taxonomy board to look at how to do this in ASEAN, and we have conversations in Latin America and other countries around this. What do you think? How useful is this, or is it a burden? Uh, for for us, in our case, the the guidance from uh, the the taxonomy, for example, um, it, it was. Uh, a no issue, if you want, because uh, we are uh, clean transportation. So it was very easy to, to tick the box. Um, I think for some uh, other sectors uh, like real estate or sectors that are still in transition, more transition, if you want, uh, um, it's a bit more difficult then to, to tick that box. Um, and it could be, then you could say be harmful to bring more supply to the market because then you are not fully aligned, right? 
Um, but nevertheless, I, I think to for, for a market like this, where we we want to build trust uh, from the to, to the investors from from the issuer, we we need to have some working toolkit uh, to to define uh, what we are investing and then the key performance measure we are going to use to measure the impact because that's really what we are doing. We are not measuring a, a, a profit in monetary term uh, that's shifting to now, uh, if you want, uh, an impact on environmental terms. And, and, and these metrics, we don't have them. I mean, all of them are not standardized yet. And so therefore, anything that can help to, uh, to standardize the, the the wording and, and the metrics that, that, that we can have and coming from the government gives it more uh, weight. Um, and that's, I think, what they should do. They should give these guidelines, they should bring these definitions into the market that then the, the market participants can all use and know what they are talking about. They can compare oranges with oranges. Um, and so maybe in the short term, it will um, slow down a little bit the, the supply, um, but, but still it, it's, it's bringing it into a, um, a, a certain formal standard that helps then for the future to really be able to scale it up. That's what I think we need this to be able to scale up what we are issuing and what we are measuring. Um, so, yeah, ch challenge here is more short term, what I think. Uh, and I for, can... Sorry, Leticia, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, yes, if I, if I can add on that, um, and especially on the EU taxonomy, it's true that it's a, first, it's a definition tool. So it helps defining what a sustainable activity or a contribution to a sustainable activity is. That's a definition tool. But as Aurelia said, and that's really important, it's also a process tool. So it's not because at the first time you're trying to align with the taxonomy, you can't reach it because there are difficult thresholds, difficult KPIs. It looks a bit scary when you look at those 200 pages of, uh, of taxonomy and you wonder where to start. But people have to remember also that it's a, it's a process. So it, it also frames how you should look at those issues. And it tells you very easily, there's a step. You should know whether you contribute to an objective First, you should set targets and KPIs. You should look at whether you do not harm the other objectives. And eventually, you should put minimum social uh, safeguards. And that's just a process. Then doing it, using the right KPIs, demonstrating is a bit more difficult. But still, you can. It, it's a frame. It's a frame. And it's a process. And so everybody should get inspired by that. I mean, for full disclosure, I need to alert our listeners that I've been involved in developing the EU taxonomy and some modest contribution to the Chinese taxonomy. But I'm interested to hear how it goes. And of course, it's a work in progress. Um, so Niraj, I've got to go to you. I mean, as I said, this has been a market driven by investors to date. There's now the piling in of regulatory steps. How's BlackRock grappling with this? And whilst this is a European discussion and a Chinese discussion, is this, I guess, is this affecting your thinking in other markets like the US or, or Asia as well, this regulatory movement around things like taxonomy and, of course, TCFD, disclosure rules? So I think that's a, that's a very important point. And some of it goes back to the discussion around the standardization, the transparency, and obviously, which leads to building the trust of the investors and what, what they are actually investing in, what exposures are they taking. And uh, it's something from, from our standpoint, obviously, we do expect and hope to see more of the standardization from a global perspective. But at the same time, every step that you see the EU and the China taxonomy getting closer, I think these are really helpful steps from a market perspective. And then the second part is as an organization, as a platform, we also spend a fair bit of time, obviously, looking through a number of these uh, investments when we think about the borrowers, when we think about these markets and building our own proprietary data set. 
you know, in a strange way, Sean, if you go back in history, that will remind you somewhat of when the rating system started. And not everybody might remember that in Asia, there used to be a lot of non-rated issuers. And you had to do your own work and try to figure out where you place someone. I think we are in a different an atmosphere, different kind of a structure. We're going through a similar process of the standardization that's still developing, but a topic that's in fact moving faster than anyone's expectations. So you do need to have your uh, your own proprietary data sets, data analytics and frameworks to actually be able to still build portfolios that are in line with what the clients are asking for. And do you see the standardization shift and the regulatory shift as uh, making that a little bit easier to cope with that because you have your own data sets. In other words, a uh, less like democratization of access for investors. Is it is. I think it, it certainly is helping. It also is in, in, in a way a function of obviously when you think about the, the data transparency itself and the availability and you have certain independent uh, rating agencies who have then obviously a little more harmonization over time in terms of the ability to to compare those for investors. I think all those, as I said, are positive steps in, in some ways, given the pace at which the market is moving in terms of evolution of the green bonds and the climate focus and broader ESG. I think obviously the pace required for these uh, standardizations is faster than any other experiences anyone has in the history. It's, it, is, it is an astounding change, isn't it? There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you mentioned that the, the harmonisation of China and Europe, and I just want to, again, say to our listeners, uh, at Climate Bonds, we're working supporting the European Commission uh, with the, this uh, project between Europe and China to come up with a common ground taxonomy. And we will be publishing a report in September uh, around that. It will be only be a first report, uh, Governor Ye Gang from the People's Bank of China has said, slightly to my shock, I have to say, that it'll be 80% consistent between the two, which is ra- raised, a, uh, put, a, put a tough benchmark we've got to achieve by September. Um, but it'll be a working document. And the goal is between the Chinese authorities and the European authorities to provide a, a common approach, the guidance, the markets that can be picked up by other markets. And um uh, so just for information, watch this space. Hopefully, Niraj, that'll address the point you make about uh, common approaches. Uh, we, we have, a, a Clifford, a, a lot to do here. What I'm curious now, what I'd like to, to move to just to finish up, is what have we got to do? And what do you need other parties to do to facilitate this change? I mean, for example... The Singapore government and the Hong Kong government have provided uh, subsidies for the independent reviews of bonds in the thematic bonds, but the green bond space, so on. I don't know whether you think that's been successful as an in- incentive or initiative by the governments to do. Are there other things? Do you think more of that? Uh, the general thing is, how do we take this forward and how do we take it forward fast? Because we've got very challenging climate goals to meet. What do you think? Well, in my opinion, and, it, and, and this is based off discussing with uh, issuers and investors alike over the past uh, five to eight years regarding this topic, I'd say that uh, harmonization and, and uh, regulatory uh, guidelines will be critical. You know, you, we all need to understand, we all need to gear towards something that is a, a lot more transparent that we all can reference off. But uh, to... In a point, even for ratings, it took a long time for Asian uh, issuers in the emerging markets to accept that rating is required and to also understand uh, the, the ways that uh, the credits are rated. Rating agencies also have to calibrate to understand that credits across the respective uh, countries will be looked upon differently and it is an uh, evolving process. So I'd say the same thing with regards to what we are trying to do now in uh, the issuance and the funding of uh, or, uh, in, in the climate uh, aligned uh, bond space in in the objectives we want to set forward, I'll say that it's an evolving uh, situation. Whilst guidelines uh, are important, I think we also need the market to evolve by itself. A green bond six, seven, eight years ago in Asia looks a bit different from what it is now. The market, the investors evolved into what they can accept. The issuers understood what's demanded uh, of the market. 
and we take the first uh, a few steps forward. So same thing for sustainability link bond, for example, right? Is very is newer and there's skepticism in the market. But I say that the more avenues, the more uh, experiments we can throw out there for the markets to react, it, it can only serve us to, to serve to move us forward. So whatever is best practices will be adhered to. Whatever is is not acceptable will slowly fade away. So for the for, for there to be a calibration between providing uh, the transparency, the consistency, the harmonization of standards, as well as experimenting with new structures to see what's acceptable and what's, you know, uh, pardon the pun, sustainable in terms of developing the market uh, sooner rather than later. Good pun, Clifford. <laughs> Leticia, <laughs> from your perspective, you've been doing this for a long time. Next steps. And what are you looking for other actors to do, whether it be credit rating agencies or investors or regulators or central banks? And I'm conscious that in Europe, we saw a couple of days ago, the release of the European Central Bank's response to climate and other matters. And we've had Jens Weidman from the Bundesbank agree, I'm going to say uh, finally agree after a long discussion, that uh, green quantitative easing is something the European Central Bank will look at. So these are interesting initiatives, in Europe at least, what do you think needs to happen? Are those important? Is it about market actors like credit rating agencies? Give us a clue. How do we make this massive? <laughs> Ambitious question. How do we make that massive? Uh, first, um, as Amanda said, actually, in, in the report, there are many ways of looking at the climate alignment of a company. Uh, be it by looking at the revenues, and there are some challenges that Amanda mentioned around that. Also looking at the location of assets, if you're looking at the climate risks of, uh, of those assets. Also looking at the supply chain. So there are many ways of looking at the climate alignment of, of a company. And there are many standards, as you mentioned, that try to help in the disclosure of, uh, of climate activities like the TCFD. Uh, but also in Europe, the in NFRG or new CSRD. Um, and that's at company level. Then at product level, it's the same thing. There are many ways of demonstrating that you're aligned uh, with either the climate bonds uh, initiative or standards or with the ICMA standards or you're unlabeled, but you also want to show climate alignment. So there are many ways. What we need is really to promote transparency around all of that. That's the, that's the key message. Um, exchanges can really support explaining the standards that are used, explaining the definitions that are used, uh, explaining to investors, so also closing the knowledge gap and explaining to investors in different regions, because investors may not be aware of what's happening everywhere in the world, explaining what's happening in there in terms of uh, taxonomies of standards. So really raising awareness around that is, is really super important. And that's what we, what we continue to do as, a, as an international exchange as well. Uh, and overall, if we are to reach the, the SDG, which is there, it's there, it's the other side, SDG number 13 on climate action, uh, it's really a collaborative effort that we need to do, a regional effort, and also all financial market players together. I, I reckon that it's ambitious, but your question was ambitious as well. Uh, we need to work together in the same direction uh, to, to foster uh, more investments in, in sustainable activities, and especially in, in climate action. So, so collaboration on this is what you're saying, which is which is great. Oh, collaboration. Thank you. Oh, Aurelia, from your perspective, you've already got an established program, although I have a hunch that under the uh, Europe's investment and the Recovery and Resilience Fund, the next generation, there's going to be more rail, which may also provide some opportunities for, or some necessities, I guess, for Eurofema to support uh, issues. We need to, by the way, everyone, expand our rail subways and land rail about three times between now and 2050, massively grow the sector to shift transport onto low carbon mechanisms. So that's a climate issue, not, not a financing issue to say how we get there is the challenge. So I would expect the Eurofema demand to grow going forward. But what do you see as the next steps in this market and, um, and the prospects for it? Just a final reflection. Final reflection. Um, I think um, it's important that uh, 
now we change mindset in terms of uh, not looking at uh, risk return anymore, but uh, really, uh, really at a third dimension, the, um, the climate impact. Uh, and uh, so for us, uh, being uh, the labor bond or the climate aligned, or uh, it's it's the same. Yeah, we we want to. Uh, we know it has to be implemented, and uh, so the the main thing is then to to align also the 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 measuring. I think for us that's the main challenge, and that what needs to 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 be done uh, to have the the same baseline the the or approach at least uh, to stand to standards and um, and to be able to 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 measure the impacts properly uh, rather than um, uh, just now the, the risk return so that third dimension that we need to to have measured on thank you in fact uh, i just want to draw attention to one of the questions in the in the q and a which was are we looking, and I guess this is, this is more taxonomy question, are we addressing embedded carbon in the energy system when we look at whether rail qualified or not? And I want to say in the European taxonomy approach and in the climate bonds taxonomy approach, we separate out the issue. We say we can't afford to wait till the grid is green before we build railways. It's part of the future. Or low carbon transport, that includes electric vehicles and hydrogen and so on. We need to start building in a parallel. So we discount the embedded emissions, knowing that shifting to some form of electric transport is still lower emissions than petrol-based come what may, uh, but we don't require that in the calculations. We simply say electric or hydrogen or low carbon transport is a priority, and in parallel, we'll work to green the grid very quickly. So that's a longer, there's a longer discussion about that in the various documentations that the client bonds initiatives has, but just to answer that particular questions. So we do not look at Eurofema's energy sources for the purposes of climate bonds and for the of course, the climate aligned universe taxonomy, just uh, by way of information. Um, uh, Amanda, any final comments or questions from you that uh, things we've missed that we really should know about in the report? No, not really. Um, the only thing that I want to point out is that <clears throat> About 30% of the issuers which we included in the research have actually already issued in the, in the green bond label, which means that some of them, of course, have already discovered the extra value which the label brings in terms of transparency. So I, the way that I see is that the other climate aligned issuers could also consider issuing with the green label so they could actually understand um, what they're really financing and the nature of their business activities. Um, on the other hand, it's quite interesting to see that, as I mentioned, we had a few challenges with finding the data, but after we actually launched the um, Green uh, Climate Align window uh, with Luxembourg Green Exchange, a few of the issuers themselves have actually reached out to us at a second stage to actually ask us, can we include it because we're actually green, right? So in fact, um, there is a value of being in a climate aligned issuers, and I think issuer, and I think um, the more, as we go forward, we'll see more companies actually reaching out to us because I think it does have an extra value. And as per the, the label bonds, uh, as we discovered in the treasury survey conducted by client bonds, the green label also offers a broader investor base. So there are quite a lot of benefits, which I really think that issuers should be considering going forward. Niraj. I guess that's music to your your ears in terms of what you're saying earlier. But final thoughts about this development from your perspective? I think that seems like a, a perfect right step in the right direction. So that certainly will be a big boost for the the discussion we had in terms of the development of the green label um, issuance. So if anyone's got a thematic bond, they should knock on your door. Well, through Clifford, I guess. Am I right in hearing that? There is demand yeah, out there. First point of uh, contact in Asia. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Niraj. Yolanda, we need to wrap up. Um, today, it's been a great, great conversation. Tell us your reflections on what you've heard today and where you think um, 
this whole discussion is going. I'd like to wrap up by going back to um, an answer the Clifford uh, gave earlier about bolstering supply of thematic bonds or label bonds. Uh, some of our customers, when we ask them, are you interested in doing a label bonds, you are able to, and they will say no, because I don't want to do things just for good PR, because that's the only value they gleam from doing a label bonds. And I would always counter by saying that there is a big difference between what is good PR and communication. And doing a local bond is a golden opportunity to communicate to the market, to all your concerned stakeholders, what you're doing. We all produce reams of sustainability reporting. And those hundreds of pages of reports, apart from the dedicated equity analysts, I don't think many of them read them. But doing a label bond is an opportunity for you to get your story out there. So why not? So there is a difference between PR and communication. We should all seize the chance. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. And we see, you know, very clear benefits for issuers of the thematic market, as Euro, as uh, Aurelia from Eurofema has been telling us. So there's a signaling benefit as we recover from the pandemic. And Clifford pointed out, it's, you know, it's been a pretty ra major impact in the last year to our markets, to thinking, to sensibilities about what to do. We do have a building back better theme, which is now dominating discourse at a couple. This is a way of signaling that you're part of that building back better theme. But it's straightforwardly a way of getting more investors. You will hear more conversations such as Niraj about the nature of demand, that the investment demand is hot, oversubscription levels are higher for thematic than non-thematic as a rule. They're pretty good for, for vanilla bonds as it is, but they're higher for thematic. And of course, in some currencies, in uh, liquid markets, you're seeing price differential being to peer on the back of the demand. One thing you can say, in the secondary market, green bonds perform better than vanilla bonds around the world. Investors are seeing them as a valuable product. And in downturns, they tend to hold their value. So they're a value retention product. Um, at least that's what we're seeing at Club Up Bonds. I'm not going to put Niraj on the spot about all of that because that's part of your pitch to him via Clifford to make these arguments and see how he responses. What I can say is Niraj is saying, we're interested, we're out there. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for our fantastic panelists to uh, Clifford, to Aurelia, Aurelia, to Leticia, to Yolanda, to Amanda, and to Niraj. Um, it's a big topic. We have a universe of investors that want to buy. We have a universe of potential issuers in the Climate Alliance universe. We need to bring these things together. We have a challenge that this is all about addressing, which is to meet our climate goals. It's a 2030 focus. 55% reductions to try and create a future that we want our children to live in. If we don't make those goals, according to the Government Panel on Climate Change, we're going to have a real problem. The kind of climate impacts that we're experiencing now, like extraordinary heat in Canada of all places, and by the way, it was snowing in southern Brazil at the same time. Ay, 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 ay. These things are going to become the norm very quickly. So we need to act to get those emissions down and to build resilience in our societies. This is what this is about. Um, there's a lot to be done. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening in. Good luck, everyone, on the panel and on our listeners, with our listeners in creating a sustainable future, both sustainable in terms of returns and sustainable in terms of a future we want for our children. Good luck. Talk again over and out. Thanks, everyone.